if you've gone come in second, you're just first loser. Tiger Woods. These are the words that ring true for so many sports professionals in such a competitive world. However, no one has lived these words more than the Northern Hemisphere nations at the Rugby World Cup. With nine editions of the Web Ellis Cup in the history books, no one can argue that the European nations have always been pulling on the shortest string. Aside from a single victory in 2003, these nations had to settle for second place on no fewer than six occasions, with the Southern Hemisphere nations hoisting a combined eight trophies over the last three and a half decades. So why does it always seem to go wrong for the likes of England, Ireland and France at the biggest rugby spectacle? Join us today as we look through the history books and tackle an age-old debate about why the Northern Hemisphere keeps failing at the Rugby World Cup. Originally made in 1906 by Gerard & Co, the Webb Ellis Trophy was modelled off a famous design by silversmith Paul de la Mer in 1736. It's made from sterling silver while standing an impressive 38 centimetres tall. A 24 karat gold plate offers a solid base while two cast scroll handles are often what we see players hold on to. But the trophy bears a massive history, specifically for the Northern Hemisphere. It's named after William Webb Ellis, an English clergyman credited for inventing the sport of rugby by picking up a ball and running with it in 1823 in a game of football. Many regarded this show as a fine disregard for the rules during an early football match. Since the origin of the trophy dates back to Europe, it's no secret that these nations have an internal fire to keep it up north. But unfortunately, it's more commonly found in the South nowadays. The reasons for this vary from expert to expert. So let's explore some recent history first. Since its induction in 1987, the Rugby World Cup has been won by a Southern Hemisphere nation eight out of nine times. The first four editions were won by New Zealand, Australia and South Africa respectively. And it wasn't until 2003 that England managed to overcome this dominance by sneaking one past the Wallabies. However, since 2003, very little has changed and the three most powerful Southern Hemisphere nations have continued to share the cup amongst themselves. As of this video, the All Blacks and Springboks are currently tied at three titles apiece, with Australia in close second with two. England is the only other nation to hoist the Webb Ellis Cup with a single win. Now, you might think, that perhaps the quality of rugby in the South is just that much better. But that's not the case. If we break down the stats even further, you'll see that England has made it to the final on four occasions, and arch nemesis France has made it to the final showdown on three occasions. If we compare this to the All Blacks and the Wallabies, you'll find they have made it to the final four times as well, with the Springboks being the only nation with a 100% winning record in the final, reaching it on three occasions. So by sheer numbers, there's not a lot of difference when it comes to reaching the final for the Northern or Southern Hemispheres. However, the South has managed to convert on these occasions more often, boasting an almost 90% winning record should they reach the final game of the tournament. But the question you should ask is why? Is it because the North simply doesn't turn up to these games? Or does the South have some tricks up their sleeve to ensure they always bring home the Webb Ellis Cup? Many might argue that we should look at where the Cup is hosted more often. But that doesn't tell the full story. To date, the Rugby World Cup has been hosted by the Southern Hemisphere nations on four occasions. And aside from one tournament in Japan, the North matches this by hosting the other four, with now the 10th edition hosted back in France as it was in 2007. So we could perhaps eliminate things like weather conditions or altitude differences, as many experts would put it. But what about the cultures? Could this play a significant role? You see, football, or soccer for our American viewers, is the most popular sport in Europe. This is closely followed by cricket, with rugby only coming in at third. If we compare this to Southern Hemisphere nations, we find that rugby is the most beloved sport. But by eliminating South American nations, who also consider football as their national sport, we're left with three nations that embody the culture of rugby. Bear in mind that our Aussie fans might correct us and tell that there's still a difference between rugby union and rugby league, but both those games still breed a culture of rugby, and we often see transition of players between the two, most notably Sonny Bill Williams. Further west, South Africa might argue that soccer is their national sport, but when we look at accomplishments, rugby sure is the sport accumulating the most awards. To put this into perspective, the cultural differences between the North and the South are vast. While kids in Australia, New Zealand and South Africa grew up with heroes like Richie McCaw, John Eels and Sia Khaleesi, 
Those up north more often see Harry Kane, Galen Mbappé and Marcus Rashford. In most situations, these kids choose to play football instead of trying rugby. Fortunately, a rugby culture still exists up north and some do choose to follow in the footsteps of heroes like Johnny Wilkinson and Brian O'Driscoll. As you can see, it is not as embedded in the culture as down south, but perhaps you can correct us in the comments. It does seem like a different culture though could play a major role. But it cannot be the only culture, can it? What about the differences in playing styles? You see, back in the earlier days before the 2015 Rugby World Cup, a noticeable difference in playing style between these hemispheres was apparent. Aside from sporadic moments of French flair, many Northern Hemisphere nations relied heavily on the power of their forwards. Games were often won by the boot of kickers instead of tries being scored, but this has since changed. With plenty of Southern influence, with coaches like Warren Gatland, Eddie Jones and Joe Schmidt, the North has adapted a more free-flowing game. Now, we could blame the miserable weather up north for this, but since these coaches have taken over, they've adopted a style that disregards the weather conditions. Games played during the Six Nations usually had lower scores, with larger margins of victory only being achieved when there was a massive skill difference between the teams. Down south, we often had large scores in close games between the likes of South Africa and New Zealand being played out with a 29-32 victory or even reaching the 40-point mark in many games. Thanks to a southern culture of spreading the ball wide more often, it was possible for more tries to be scored, leading to a more entertaining brand of rugby, something the governing body of rugby has been trying to instill over the last decade with numerous rule changes and experimentation. Fortunately, these changes have seen some progress being made and we can see the likes of England, France and Ireland now playing a faster game. Players like Conor Murray, Owen Farrell and now Antoine Dupont believe in more in scoring tries than kicking goals. Essentially, scores between northern nations have seen a significant change, with more tries being scored compared to the earlier years of the 21st century. To put this into perspective, 74 tries, or 4.93 per game, were scored during the 2003 Six Nations. By comparison, we find that 91 tries have been scored during the 2023 edition of the Championship. Now, many of you will quickly point out to the rule changes, but that is exactly why the rules were changed. In comparison to the 2003 Tri-Nations Tournament, delivered an astonishing 33 tries, or 5.5 per game. Bear in mind that this tournament only featured six games, compared to 15 for the Northern Hemisphere Tournament. You also see this transferring over to the Rugby World Cup, with the Northern Hemisphere often scoring far fewer tries than their Southern counterparts during the tournament. But even with an increase in tries to the North during the modern era, perhaps there are a few things they could still learn from the teams down South. As we've already mentioned, the rule changes and influence from the South have made a massive difference. Perhaps there are a few things the North could still do to improve their chances. One of the first things that comes to mind is player development. You see, in Southern nations heavily rely on youth coming through the ranks. These nations rely on local competitions to breed new players. On the other hand, nations like France have been investing millions of dollars to buy stars from the South. Now, you could argue that this makes their competitions much more fierce, but as the Stormers have proven during the 2021-22 United Rugby Championship, local talent can still achieve huge success. Whilst these tougher conditions up north have bred some excellent players in the likes of Antoine Dupont and most recently Josh van der Fleer, only a handful truly get the opportunity. Would you really choose a young unknown player over the likes of Andre Pollard? Probably not. Thanks to a focus on local development though, the South has not only developed great players, but they often back this up with depth. Let's take New Zealand as an example. The All Blacks can call on the likes of Damian McKenzie, Bowden Barrett and Richie Mwanga to fill the 10 jersey. In comparison, Northern Hemisphere nations often have to rely on a single superstar. Think Johnny Sexton with Ireland. Once injuries happen, they have a massive gap to fill. Another possible lesson the North could learn would be to take more risks. Whilst this has increased with the new law changes and Southern influence from coaches, many Northern Hemisphere nations still struggle to choose five points over three. But rugby is always evolving and with more influence coming from the South, various new rules being experimented with and more frequent games between Northern and Southern Hemisphere nations, this could all change in the future. So will the European nations catch up to the likes of South Africa, New Zealand or Australia in the future? There's very little doubt that the gap between these two hemispheres has narrowed significantly over the past decade. 
as of this video, France, Scotland, and Ireland all occupy the top five positions in the global rankings. Influence from coaching figures and large financial investment that attract more Southern Hemisphere players could significantly change the game over the next decade. However, it might still hinder talent development. Predictions are always tough to make and we will have to wait and see. But as of this video, it looks more promising for the North to compete at the Rugby World Cup. With ex-England coach Clive Woodward saying, I think the Northern Hemisphere has never been in a better position to do something special this year. But as the tensions rise and competition ramps up between the North and the South, we would love to see what you think. Do you think the Northern Hemisphere can ever come close to winning more Webb Ellis trophies? Or will the Southern Hemisphere dominance continue undeterred?